Uh, Philippians 3, here we go. Let's read verses uh, 16 through the end of the chapter. Before we do, let's, let me give one quick word about introduction. We've talked for a couple weeks now. Paul, uh, through verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, he's, he's talking about his desire to know Jesus. The surpassing greatness, the excellency of knowing Jesus, having a relationship with him. And Paul tells us that he's yearning, he's pressing, he's working, he's laboring, he's striving in order to press in and get relationship with Jesus. Uh, he uses the same word three times throughout this chapter. Uh, he uses it actually as persecuted earlier in the chapter. But then he says in verse number 12, uh, I follow after, about the second phrase in. Verse number 14, he says, I press. It's the same word that when he used it for persecuting the church, he was saying, I gathered up the church and I tried to, I tried to pound it down and out of existence. But now I'm gathering up myself and I'm pounding myself towards Jesus, trying to get Jesus to press, to yearn, to strive towards Jesus. We used this analogy of David a thousand years before Paul, who wrote in Psalm 63 that my soul followeth hard after God. That inside I'm yearning and I'm pressing and I'm craving and following hard after God. I want more of him. And the question is, how do we do this? That's the question for this morning. How, like in practical terms, how do we follow hard after Jesus? I don't want it just to be kind of mystical. I want it to be very practical. And Paul does us the favor of making it very practical. I'm going to give you three this morning. I could give you more than three from different places where Paul says that I forget those things which are behind and reach forth to those which are before. You know, we could talk a long time about forgetting the negative stuff in your past and the good stuff in your past and just realizing it's in the rearview mirror and I'm pressing forward, but we won't. I'll avoid all of that and we'll just cover new content. So here we go. Verse number 16. How exactly do we do this? How do we follow hard after? 16. Nevertheless, Whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things." For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able to even to subdue all things unto himself. I'm going to give you three things this morning on how you can very practically follow hard after God. How can we put this into practice, what Paul has been advocating now for the past few verses, and let's start with 16, and I love this thought. Paul's going to give us a checkpoint before we actually get to how we do this. He's just going to stop and give us a checkpoint. Verse 16, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. What Paul is saying here in short is continue in what you know. Walk in it. Take what you've already been given, use it as a foundation, and build off of that and continue in that don't be the guy or girl who wants new revelation but doesn't want to be obedient to what you've already been taught and what you already know. Don't be the person that's saying, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. Say, teach me, as long as you're putting into practice what you're already learning. Don't teach me, teach me, and not be obedient. Maybe then you just need to be obedient to what you've already been taught before you learn something new. And th this is a tendency that all of us have, that we want to absorb new information when we're not doing what we already know to do. And Paul is just stopping. Hey, let's hit a checkpoint right here. Continue to walk in what you already know. Continue to build off that foundation. Continue to apply that. Because if you're not doing that, the only alternative is to grow in a lie. The only alternative is for you to continue to amass information mentally, but you have no intention of applying it to your life. And if that's the case, then you're growing in a lie you're, that's doing you no good. And there is, a, there is a connection between growing in truth and not just, not just mentally assimilating it in a cognitive way, but growing in truth in a practical way, putting it into work. There's a connection between that and you being obedient to what you already know. To, to grow and to mature and to continue to press on in Jesus, you have to continue to do what you've already been taught, and you have to start there. So Paul is saying, 
Let's hit a checkpoint before we get to some new stuff to work this out practically. Maybe we just need to talk about what I've, our, what I've already told you. Maybe it's just I need to say, okay, Lord, forgive me. Let's just start there. I am playing a game. I'm not pressing. I'm not working. I'm not being diligent. I'm not pursuing you. I'm not, I'm, I haven't even started to try at all, much less here are some tangible ways I can do that. I haven't, I've made zero effort, Lord. So maybe we need to start there by saying, okay, I, I don't want to play the game. I, want, I, I don't want to keep making excuses for, for why I can't make time for Jesus. I want to lay the excuses to the side and continue to press on to Jesus and make time for him and to wire my life in such a way that it is pointed towards him. So Paul stops there and says, look, don't be, a, don't be a spectator on this stuff. Don't just be assuming and learning on this stuff. Walk in it. Continue. Build off of that. Do what you already know to do. Get out of the grandstands and in the game and start to, start to work. Don't just come to church and, and come with the idea of, I want to hear a good sermon. I want to learn something new. Hopefully you get a, a decent sermon and hopefully you do learn something new, but that's not the goal. The goal is to get something that you can take and that you can transform your heart from the inside out and to begin to be molded and shaped into the image of Christ and that you can learn and grow and be changed a bit. That's the goal. You want something to happen inside that manifests itself on the outside, not just let me file this away as useful information or, oh, that was a good nugget. I'm sure I can beat someone else up with that truth and I can tell them that. That's not the goal. The goal is to walk and to continue in what you already know. So apply that to yourselves. And Paul challenges them here and says, look, no matter how far you've come, continue in that. Don't, don't forsake that stuff. Continue to press and to pursue Jesus Christ. But now let's, let's talk about maybe how that would work out. First way, follow godly examples. Verse number 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. And I'll just stop there. You say, wow, that seems a bit self-aggrandizing, Paul. Like, follow me. I've arrived, here I am, I, I've, you know, attained, I'm a bit mature, you know, follow me. Understand the customs of the day. Paul's a Jewish man who grew up in a, in a Jewish culture, and Paul was a, a young Pharisee who sat at the feet of a rabbi named Gamaliel. You can read that in Acts chapter number 22. That he sat at his feet and he learned. And when you sat at the feet of a rabbi, it was more than just a dialogue. It was more than just giving you some information that you wrote down. It wasn't school from eight to three where I got a bunch of information. You got a bunch of information, but the desire and the, and the goal of sitting at the feet of a rabbi was to put into practice and to mimic the rabbi so that you could materialize and actually work out what you were learning in a mental way. You could work it out in a practical way and you could internalize the teaching that way. By trying to mimic and copy and follow the example of the leader. So Paul had this from, from Judaism. This was, this was very normative to him. This is something that is being transferred over to the Christian life and should be transferred to the Christian life. Where Paul is saying, look, you can follow me. And it is a given that Paul is following Christ. Paul told the Corinthians, follow me as I follow Christ. So that's, that's an understood here. Paul's not being a spiritual maverick and, and trailblazing on his own. He is following Jesus. And if you've, if you've ever played the game Follow the Leader, you get this. I'm trying to play this a little bit with my kids right now, but they're, they're kind of resistant to the idea. They'll follow me for like two seconds, and then they just go do their own thing. They don't really want to do it. But you get the idea of someone's leading, and then someone's after them, and someone's after them, and someone's after them, and, and you're all walking the same path. And Paul's saying, I'm following Jesus. He's out in front. He's the leader. I'm behind them, and tuck in behind me. Walk after him, and, and we can do this. But then he goes further than that, and he, and he says, and mark them, which walk so as ye have us for an example. What this is saying is, be on the lookout for people who are walking the walk. Have your head on a swivel and be searching for and taking note of those who walk as we have taught you. Now, I want to make sure that this is extremely practical. I don't want this to be squishy at all this morning. I want it to be very concrete. There's a constant idea in Scripture that your relationship with the Lord is deeply personal, but it's not private. 
All right, so it's personal and that there are aspects of your relationship with the Lord that, that would be just between you and him. You will enter into your prayer closet. It will be personal that you'll, that you'll feel in your soul in a deep way, but it's not supposed to be a strictly private thing that's in a bubble that you never talk about, that you never share, that you never pray with anybody, that you never have an accountability partner, that you never have someone that you're sharing in life with. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be something that that you do have accountability partners, that you do have people that have you under their wing, who are mentoring you, who are helping you, who are tutoring you to some degree. And what Paul is saying is, be on the lookout, find and identify godly men and women and get under them. And that's not that complicated. That's actually relatively simple. Find someone who's walking the walk and get under them. Ask them to help you. Ask them to mentor you. Ask them to pray with you. Ask them to teach you. Ask them to have a meal with you. Find people who are, who are doing it and learn from them and glean from them. And he uses the word mark them. It means to, to really look and observe diligently, to, to contemplate, to direct your attention to them is what he's saying. Take those people and get under them. Now, let me warn you of a couple things. Number one, you may have the tendency to want to try to find the total package. There's a danger that when you're looking for some sort of mentor that you want to find someone who's like, you know, little Paul in our modern day. That I want someone who is fluent in Koine Greek. I mean, they don't even have an English Bible. They, you know, KJV is nothing to them. They read it in the Greek, you know. And while they're doing that, they're loving their wife as Christ loved the church. And while they're doing that, they're, they're raising some godly kids and they're a perfect example of, of fatherhood or motherhood. And while they're doing that, they're writing hymns to Jesus every morning while on the mission field. And I want that person to mentor me. Now, if you can find that person, have at it. Great, good, I'm glad that you do. Odds are, though, you're going to find someone who is proficient in an area that you're deficient in. And they may not be proficient in every area of their Christian walk, but they may have got that one down and you want to learn that. And maybe that they, man, maybe they're not the, the brightest theologian in the world, but they know how to love their wife as Christ loved the church. And you can say, you know what, I'm struggling on that. Would you help me? It may be that, that they don't, Maybe they're a widower. Maybe they're not even married right now, but they have kids that are grown, that are serving the Lord, and they have a good relationship with, and you look at that, and you admire that, and you want that, and you say, you know what? Can we get a meal after church next Sunday? Can, can me and my wife sit down, and you talk to us and help us, and you maybe rub off, off on us, and can we pick your brain a little bit? There's some of that that you need to say, where am I deficient? Where can I find somebody? Help me, shape me, guide me, and you, you want to look for people like that and get under them. Now, there is a flip side of that coin where in other passages of Scripture, the mentors are encouraged to go find mentees and to put them under their wing. But that's not this text. This text is putting the onus on those that need to grow. And it's saying go find someone, search someone out, mark them, and, and learn from them and grow from them. So it's a two-way street, but particularly this morning, it's go find someone and, and get under them. And live, live a life where someone is spiritually mentoring you. Danger number two I'll warn you of, Try to have it be someone that can actually know you. You can have the radio personality that you're never going to meet mentor you in some way and they can influence you from a distance. That's fine. But that's going to fall a bit short because they're not actually going to be able to speak into your life directly. They're not going to be able to hold you accountable directly. So you want someone that actually is around you, that knows you, that you have conversation with to be able to help and shape and guide you. You want to seek that person out and be very intentional about finding spiritual mentors in your life. If this seems threatening to you or this seems difficult or I just couldn't foresee myself walking up to someone and saying, will you mentor me? Will you help me? We literally have a program at the church that's designed to do all of the legwork for you. We, we have a discipleship program where we have people that have been around a while, have grown a bit. They're not perfect, but they're growing and they're taking their relationship with Jesus seriously who have volunteered to say, I will mentor somebody. And if, and if you need that, you can just write on your connection card, email me about discipleship or mentorship and we'll give you all the information, but we'll take all the legwork out and put you with someone for 90 days that once a week you'll sit down for an hour and you'll study and you'll learn and you'll grow and you'll pray together and you'll be helped. If, if we need to do that for you, that's fine. We're happy to, but there needs to be some pushing, some, some prodding, some I want to get someone to help me and to speak into my life. 
Paul's saying, follow some godly examples. By the way, while you're at it, those who have already been examples to you, tell them thank you. Grandma, mom, dad, other people, maybe in another church, maybe in this church, whatever, write them a note, tell them thank you, you'll be glad that you did. But find someone to mentor. Find multiple people to mentor. Walk up to someone and say, man, I'm struggling with this. I heard you share a testimony in Sunday school and it seems like you've realized some victory here. Can I call you every day this week and we just talk for five minutes? Maybe pray with me. That, that, I know that that's outside of many of your comfort zone, but it's recommended by Paul. You want to press, you want to grow, you want to you strive, you want to, to pick yourself up and pound yourself towards a relationship with Jesus. Part of the way you can help yourself is find someone to follow their example. Find someone to get under their wing a bit and have them help you. Second way is flee ungodly enemies. This is the flip side of the coin. And Paul says in verse number 18, the opposite of these people, there's many that walk of whom I've told you often and now tell you even weeping. That's a unique place in Scripture. Only place where Paul says, I'm presently weeping. He references his tears often, but this is the only one where he says, I am currently, while I write this, I am now telling you weeping. Paul's footsteps were, were followed all the time by false teachers who would come in after him and try to lead people astray and try to teach them something different and try to use their angle or their agenda to manipulate people. And with deep emotional anguish, Paul describes the reality of life. It's, it's just hold, hard, hard, cold reality. That there are those that Paul says, I've told you about them, and here's, here's what they are. He says at the end of verse 18, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, I'll, I will do you a disservice if I don't tell you the truth here. That's not an extremely popular phrase. But there are those that are enemies and they are against the cause of Jesus. There are those that are overtly against Jesus who have no trouble telling you, I don't like Jesus or Christians or God or whatever. There are also those who are covertly, Paul is more after the covert here, but there are those that are covertly after against Jesus. They will use Jesus' name, they will use a guise of Christianity, they'll be a wolf in sheep's clothing, but they're actually against and they're an enemy of the cross of Christ is how Paul describes them. Now I ask myself, I've always wanted to know the context so I can apply it the right way, who are these people? Who are these people, which Paul has told them often, and now he's even crying and telling them, that they're enemies? Like, how can I put a face to these people? What are these people? What are they teaching? What are they like? To be honest, we can't be entirely sure who Paul is referring to. There's a lot of debate, and you just can't be entirely sure. But you can boil it down to two options. Paul is referring to either Judaizers or Libertines. Those are the technical names for these people. Judaizers are people that said, we believe in Jesus. We believe that he died, that he died for our sins. We even believe he rose from the dead. But in order to get right standing with God, you need to have faith in Jesus and you need to blank. And we looked at this at the beginning of chapter three. And you need to be circumcised. And you need to obey the law. And you need to do this. In order to have right standing with God, it's faith plus something. And Paul says, no, 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 no. Grace plus something is no longer grace. That's not the gospel. You're adding to it and you're ruining it. You're destroying it. You're making people try to earn right standing with God and that's not the way it works. And he's against that. It also could have been the libertines, which are kind of the opposite of that. They're not trying to add to and add things, uh, weight on people. They're attempting to say, you know what? Free salvation, get out of hell free card, fire insurance, grace, awesome. Now just go do whatever I want. I will live in my liberty and I will pursue my flesh, my appetites, my desires, my lust, and I will do whatever I want and, and not even consider the consequences of God because I already have grace, so I'm just going to move forward. And Paul's very clear on that, that if you love the Lord, you, you walk after him, you keep his commandments, you, you want to follow him. It's not just I do whatever I want now that I, now that I have prayed a prayer. So it could be one of either of those. I'm prone to think that it's the opposite, that it's the latter, it's the libertines, but I'm going to dissect both of them quickly for you. And this will help us learn how we can apply this in, in a tangible way. But quickly, we'll, we'll contrast them. The, the contrast is actually in your outline, and you can see that and follow it with me. Here's what he says, four descriptors about these people. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. That's the description of these people. We'll take them one by one. Who's into destruction? It's the same whether you're a Judaizer or a Libertine. It's the same either way there. The sum of their teaching will lead to destruction. 
The sum total of their teaching will lead to perdition, to damnation. This actually will not work when it comes to right standing with God. This long term is going to backfire. The end game here is that it's actually destruction. The end is not good. They're acting like they're on Team Jesus, but they're not on Team Jesus. They, they, they got a mock fake jersey on, but they're not really on the team. This should not surprise us because Jesus said pretty much the same thing in Matthew chapter number 7, which is a scary passage of Scripture if you've ever read it. It should make your hair stand on end. That Jesus says, many will say it to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we cast out devils? In thy name we've done many wonderful works? Lord, look at all the wonderful things I did for you. And he says, I will look at them and I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. That's scary. That there are, there are people that are exhibiting a spirituality that is nothing more than a coat of cobwebs spread over their materialism or their legalism or their self-indulgence that don't actually know the Lord. And Paul says their end is destruction. You want nothing to do with them. They are not on Team Jesus. I know that we live in a day and age that most people want to say, well, truth is relative. It doesn't really matter. We're all going to the same mountain. And, you know, you can't really say that, you know, you're not on a team. This, that. The Bible says otherwise. It says beware of this. Don't be sucked into this. Second to Scripture he gives, whose God is their belly. You say, what does that mean? Well, it depends on who he's talking about. Maybe he's talking about both, but if he's talking about the Judaizers, he's saying that they so prioritize their kosher diet and what the Old Testament prescribed and what you can eat and what you can't eat that they are now idolizing this diet and they're substituting that in the place of God. If he's talking about the libertines, he's saying that they serve their fleshly appetite so much that really their fleshly desires and appetites is their God. We would have in our, in this year, come February-ish, Mardi Gras will take place in New Orleans. What is Mardi Gras? Mardi Gras is, I want my belly to be my God. Mardi Gras is, I am going to fill up all of my fleshly appetites and I will do whatever I want for a few days. And on Fat Tuesday, I'll put a cherry on top of it all and I will live it up, drink it up, eat it up, everything it up. And then come Ash Wednesday, when Lent season starts, then I'll restrict myself and I'll be a good boy or girl. It is a, I want my belly to be my God and I want to fill up all of my appetites and pursue them and let them rule me and dominate me so that it'll be a little bit easier to limit myself a, a bit later. Now, to be clear, Mardi Gras has grown into more than that, but that's the, that's the conception and even what many people still would treat it as today. It's your belly being your God. It's pursuing your appetites. He says, whose glory is their shame. They are glorying or boasting in something they should be ashamed of. If it's Judaizers, they're glorying in their works that they're adding to earn their own righteousness, and they should be ashamed of that because it's wrong. If it's those that are libertines, they're glorying in their sensual activity, and look what I can do. I have freedom. I have grace. Look, I'll just do whatever I want and run amok, and that should be shameful, Paul says. That they are glorying in something that they should not be glorying in, and they mind earthly things. Judaizers, they're enamored with Sabbath days and feast days and diets. Libertines, they're enamored with just the pleasures and appetites of this life. But either way, no matter how you shake it, it comes down to they, they're fix, fixated on the temporal. They're fixated on something that is earthly. Their mind is set on them, and it's, it's nowhere in regards to Jesus in, in eternity. It may be under the guise of that, but it's not in actuality. And Paul says you want to be aware of that and you want to flee that and you want to get away from that. If this is the Libertines, as I think it is, this is the exact opposite of what Paul told us to do in 12 through 14. He said, I limit myself, I strain, I'm disciplined, I push, I pursue, I work. And now he's saying these are the people that there is no self-constraint, there is no discipline, there is no working, there is no pushing. It's just floating along and doing whatever I feel like doing. And he says you want to follow the people that are good examples, that are doing what I've told you. You want to avoid the people that are exactly the opposite. Let me make this very concrete. I would do two things if I were you. Number one, 
I would detox your life of those who you know are overtly opposed to the gospel. So I'm not, I'm not saying don't be around people that aren't on Team Jesus and influence them. You need to do that. That's biblical. You need to have lunch with your coworkers. You need to influence your neighbors and be neighborly. You need to go to their cookout and, and try to influence them for Jesus and share the gospel with them. That's a beautiful thing. Jesus did a lot of that. But you do not want to invite those who are overtly opposed to Jesus to influence you and now to have a platform in your life where they can start to spin things that are completely antithetical to Scripture that now you're buying into. You want to be very careful not to fill your social media feed with movie star, rock star, Mrs. Fitness, Mr. Money, who are all about things that are entirely earthly and nothing in regard to the eternal. All right, can, can we just make it that practical? You don't want people to be feeding you lines of thinking that are opposed to the gospel that's going to wreak havoc in your life. That's not wise. Unfollow them, get rid of them, pick up a pastor or someone else to follow or to help you and to influence you. You don't want to invite people to influence you who you know are overtly opposed to Jesus. Now, what about those that are covertly opposed to Jesus? We could spend a whole month on this. I'll make it very brief. Paul said in chapter 1 that he was praying for the Philippians, that they would increase in judgment so that they could approve the things that were excellent. What he said to them was, I'm praying for you that your discernment would increase so you would be able to discern spiritually what is right and wrong and what is, what is good and bad, what's going to be healthy and what's going to be unhealthy. Now, there's a lot I could give you on exactly how to do that, but I would just start here, pray. Say, Lord, increase my judgment. Lord, increase my discernment. Because there are those who will be under the umbrella of evangelicalism or under the umbrella of Christianity and will want to have an agenda and they will lead you astray with false teaching and it, and it will not produce health in your life. It will hurt you. There are those, I love our day and age. I love that we more than any generation of Christians ever, we have so much good content that we have access to. We have podcasts and radio and live streams and books, I mean just galore, that are treasures and are really good, but there's a flip side to that coin. More than any generation previously, there's a lot of trash out there that can lead you astray. Just because you walked into the Christian bookstore doesn't mean it's actually going to be good to read that. Just because they're on Christian radio or that television station that's supposed to be Christian in nature does not mean it's going to help you. It could be that that is going to hurt you. Even in my own life, I'm amazed at times where I'll, on YouTube or on the radio or something, I'll come across a song and I'm like, that's a good song. I like that song. It ministers to me. And I start to put it on repeat and that's the way I do my music. I'll get a song and I'll just listen to it like a million times in a row throughout the week and then I'll find the next one the new week. That's how I do it. So I'll, I'll get this, but inevitably I'll say, man, I love that song. I want to find out more about this person. And I'll start to listen to maybe the album or the CD that the song is in. And I'm constantly amazed at now I start to listen to the 10 different songs and half of them are trash. The one I got was great. It was awesome. But I, I do, I listen, I, not really CD because it's more digital now, I know. But you know what I'm saying. CD, I start to listen to it. And half of them are filled with humanistic philosophy that's completely sideways when it comes to accurate theology. And you have to be careful of that. You have to be discerning in that. You have, to, you have to walk through that and understand that there are a lot of things that can lead me astray. And so begin to pray, Lord, increase my judgment so that I can approve the things that are excellent. That's the verbatim way to pray it. You can just say, Lord, I need more spiritual discernment. Help me. Begin to pray that in your life and get away from Get away from the things that will lead you away from Jesus. Third, and lastly, focus on your expectations. Paul says their, their focus is entirely earthly, but, verse 20, our conversation is in heaven. Conversation was the word that they would use for politics or citizenship. He's saying our citizenship is in heaven. The, the, he's writing to the Philippians. This is a Roman colony. They, they have Roman citizenship. That was a big deal in the first century. And they know exactly what he's saying. Don't glory in and revel in your citizenship being 
in Rome, revel and in glory in your citizenship, being in heaven. If you've ever traveled more than 100 miles outside of this area, draw a 100-mile radius and then travel outside of that, you know that anything outside of 100 miles, probably even less than that, but we'll call it 100 miles, anything outside of that screams, we ain't Western PA. <laughs> like you go anywhere in the country, in our country, or you go internationally, it just screams, this ain't home. It doesn't feel like home. They don't talk like home. They don't act like home. The, their temperaments, their culture, it is, it is just different. If you've never traveled, I know that some of you probably never have actually gone more than 100 mile rate. Do it sometime just for the fun of it, and you'll, and you'll know what I'm talking about. It tells you, and it just reminds you over and over and over again, this is not Western PA. This is different. Maybe we're different, but regardless, it's different. And if you've experienced that, you should be able to relate with Paul is saying that even when we are home here, that there's a portion of us that is constantly being reminded of this is not home. This, this isn't where it's at. This isn't where our citizenship is at. This isn't where our loyalties lie. This isn't where, this isn't where everything feels at peace and at home all the time. It's actually in heaven and there's a day coming where we will be in home. That we will be there, that it will be realized. There's, there's a day coming that we will feel that, that angst inside of us will dissipate and we will, we will then be home with the Lord. And Paul's saying, put your, put your focus there. Know that that's coming. Know that you're a citizen of heaven. Dwell on that. Meditate on that. Understand that every single night we pitch our tent a day's journey closer to our actual home. And have your conversation or your citizenship lie there. Structure your life in such a way that you're living for the eternal. The way that you engage people with the gospel, the way that you spend your money, the way that you structure your life should be moving towards, I know that that's my actual home, that will be my, that will be my permanent home, and this is actually temporary. You don't go, I've said this before, but it bears repeating. None of you have ever redecorated a hotel room because you understand I'm here for a night or two or maybe even a week, but it's temporary. I'm not going to spend my time, my, my thought patterns, my energy, or my money redecorating this place because I have an actual home that I'm going to invest that in. And in many respects, you're in the hotel room right now. Life is a vapor. It's short. Compared to eternity, it is insignificantly short. We can't even wrap our minds completely around that, but this is your hotel room, so don't invest all of your time and your energy and your money just on earthly things. It's not to say you can't think about anything that's on earth because we have lives, I get that, but you don't invest your affection and your attention and your emotion. You put that in the heavenlies and you understand that's where my citizenship is. That, that's what I value. That's what I'm prioritizing. That's what I want. He says, we put our, our conversations in heaven. Then from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are putting it there. We're looking for him. Our citizenship's there. Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father there. So I'm going to put my gaze on Jesus. Colossians 3 says it this way, set your affection on things above, not on things of earth. But if we're halfway honest, we find this difficult to do, do we not? At least I do. I mean, I'm a pastor and I do. We find it difficult to shove our hearts up into the heavenlies, to devote our time and our attention and our effort there. We become very preoccupied with the money that we're earning and the house that we have and the, what our clothes look like and keeping up with the society around us. But as life is short, it will be gone before you know it. And you want to play the long game. You want to live for what will last. You want your affection and your ambition and your desires to be pointed towards the heavenlies. Like, like the needle of a compass seeks the North Pole, you want your heart to seek Jesus. You want it to be magnetized towards him to where you're constantly looking, gazing, pointing in that direction. You want him to captivate all that you are. 
Then he says, verse 21, a very, a very specific aspect of the heavenly, of the one day, of our future. We look to Jesus, and Jesus shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is vintage Paul. This is a climactic moment where Paul is taking the, the future hope, and I say hope in the biblical way, the rock-ribbed assurance based on his promises, that my assurance of what I'm going to have one day, and he's merging it with the power of Jesus who will bring that into realization, and he will bring this to fruition, and he's taking this assurance and the Jesus who makes this possible, and he's pulling this together to build this beautiful tapestry of Jesus is going to change my body one day, and I know he's going to do it by the same power that he subdues everything else that he rules and reigns and has all power and, and will do it with everything, including me because of my faith in him. And Paul is celebrating the fact that one day it's coming that we will enjoy in resurrection. We sang this morning about, the choir sang about, I will arise, Jesus telling his disciples that. We sang about we serve a risen Savior, but that realization will be ours as well. Christ was the first fruits of the resurrection that one day that will be us, that this body that is prone to sickness and disease and pain and deterioration that, and sin even, that one day will die. That body is going to be raised, but it will not be like I know it now. It will be glorious. It will be fashioned after Jesus, and I will move through eternity in my resurrected glorified state. That's, that's all through the Scripture, and it's something that churches, for whatever reason, don't talk about a ton, but it's, it's prevalent all through Scripture that we hope in that, and we put our stock in that, and we glory in that, and we focus on that. Jesus came to Martha when Lazarus died, and he asked Martha, he said, don't you know that Lazarus will, raise, will be raised from the dead? And Martha said, Jesus, I know that. The last day he'll be raised. And he said, no, 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 Martha. I'm the resurrection and the life. Amen. Those that put their faith in me. That, this is how this is realized. Let me demonstrate this for you. And here came Lazarus. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians and he tells us that the dead will be raised incorruptible. That death will be swallowed up in victory on that day where we are raised. Paul told King Agrippa at the beginning of his conversation with Agrippa, apparently Agrippa had heard about Jesus and that he was crucified and that he was buried and that he rose from the dead. And he said, King Agrippa, do you think that this, is, that this is crazy, that this is something extraordinary, that God will raise the dead? Is that outlandish to you, that the God who has all power will raise the dead? Like that seems pretty easy for God to me. That's something that will take place, that we can put stock in. And Paul is saying, look, Believe that, focus on that, understand your citizenship is there. We're gazing on Jesus, that's where he is. And one day we will be raised with him. So we want to celebrate that and understand the big picture in the long game. How do I press in? How do I pursue? How do I follow hard after? Will you focus on what will be yours? You think about it, you meditate on it. You can close your eyes in your bedroom and just picture it if you want to. You, you, you dwell on that. Turn to Romans 8 for a minute. I'll, I'll end with this. Romans 8. I probably don't have time, but I did it in the first service, so I want to do it for you as well. I don't want you to feel like you were left out, that they got something that you didn't. I want to be fair. I don't have time to unpack every phrase of this, of this passage, but I'll give you the core thoughts. This is an awesome, celebratory passage concerning the scope of redemption, that it goes beyond you and me even. Verse number, look at 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I won't talk a lot about that, but if you're saved, the Spirit will impress it upon you. will know that you're saved. Verse 17, and if we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God. We're joint heirs with Christ. That's awesome. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul is saying that there's going to be a glory reveal. We have gender reveals in our day and age now that you reveal the gender of the children. A couple of you uh, here recently, the 
Dave is in here somewhere, shot an arrow. I saw that on Facebook, and he popped a balloon, and pff, blue, it was a boy. I saw just this last week that, uh, that Joe Miller, uh, little Joe, shot, I don't know what he shot, but it exploded, and it was a ton of blue smoke all over the place. I don't know if you're supposed to do that. Don't tell someone that happened, but it did. It, yeah, it's a boy, and they celebrate the gender reveal, you know, 20 weeks into pregnancy. Here it is. Paul's saying there's going to be a glory reveal one day. And the suffering of this world and what we go through in this world, the, the negativity, the persecution, the, the physical pain, all of that, it's not even worthy to be compared to what we will have one day. That it is, so, it is so finite, it's so small, it's so insignificant when you compare it and contrast it to what is going to come one day, that there's going to be a glory that's revealed that's awesome that we want to think about, we want to dwell on and meditate on. And he even says this, and I, I love this passage of Scripture, for the earnest expectation of the creature, now he's going to go beyond us to all of creation. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. What he's saying is that creation itself is standing on its tippy toes, as it were, waiting for this to be manifest in us, waiting for the glory to be revealed in us, because creation is going to join in with us. That we will receive a glorified body, but Jesus will reconcile all things into himself. That's Colossians 1, that he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth, that everything will be made new, and that even creation, the trees, the grass, the shrubs, the, the animals are waiting on their tippy toes for this to happen to us because then it will happen to them. He continues, verse 20, for the, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because... The creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That even creation is going to be included in this and will be made right and whole again. And the lion will lay with the lamb and the thorns won't be there any longer. Verse 22, awesome. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. That all the creative order is groaning and travailing and longing for this day that will come where it will be made right, it will be made new, and everything will be put back in proper order. That even the trees creak and the wolf howls wanting this day. And the point of this is that that groaning and that yearning and that angst and that desire should be in us. You should realize that this is for us. Amen. That there is something inside of us that wants to be home. That wants that day. That wants the, the sin and the sickness and all of it gone. That yearns for that. And Paul says, focus on that. Understand what is coming. And that is in Jesus who subdues all things into himself. Amen. That is in his power. That this will come, and you, you, want, you want to press in, you want to follow hard after, it's according to this text, there's a few ways, it is very simple. Find them, find the people that are going to help you and shape you and mentor you and get under them. Get away from the people that are going to lead you astray and are enemies of the cross of Christ that you want nothing to do with. I say, Lord, bend my heart towards eternity. Push my heart in the heavenlies. I want my gaze on you. I want to think about and I want to dwell on and consider what is coming one day that based on your word I can know is sure. And I would leave you this morning with just this thought. When is this going to occur? When, when is the introspection going to occur? When, when is the taking inventory of your life and trying to arrange it in such a way that it's pushed towards Jesus, when will that occur? When are you going to sit down and ask yourself, how am I going to follow hard after? If, if you aren't there now, I'm not even saying you're doing it. You're just asking yourself the question, when and how am I going to do this? If you're not there now, I pray, we sing, we baptize, we go home, and we leave here the same way we came in. And we wasted three weeks on walking through this passage of Scripture where Paul is saying, I am I'm gathering myself up and I'm pounding myself towards Jesus in relationship with Him. And here are some practical ways that I'm doing that. Do it. And you won't regret it. That's the beauty of it. 
Like it won't be a bait and switch. You won't be let down. There's excellency. There's surpassing greatness in it. We, we have to. We have to ask ourselves a tough question. Am I doing this? And if not, why? And when am I going to do this? And don't wait. Don't, not tomorrow. Do it. Press, push, prod, yearn. Go towards it. He wants you to. And deep down, you probably want to as well. 